And while you guys are turning there, let's go ahead and just take another moment to pray, um, and then we'll get right into it. Father, thank you so much, God, for uh, uh, this blessing, Lord, that we get to come together. Thank you for uh, the gift that um, of your salvation, of your wisdom and your power, God. Thank you for demonstrating that through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that um, we invite you here right now, Holy Spirit, to just uh, remove all distractions from our hearts and our minds and just to uh, be open to what you have to say, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen. So in Ephesians 3, starting in verse 1, Paul takes a moment here to move on from what he's been talking about, you know, just how great God is, the work that God, or the work that Jesus has been doing for the Father, for us, on our behalf. And in verse 1, he starts with saying, starts off with saying, when I think of all of this, he's been talking about, well, what is this, everything that Joe, Pastor Joe, and Manny have been talking about chapters 1 and 2, everything that God has done for us. But before he continues, we're actually going to pick up this idea of what he's going to get into in verse 14, but he takes a moment to address uh, something that was pretty well known in the Gentile world. So he's, he starts off, and then he stops, and he says, uh, after that, he says, Paul, a prisoner, or I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. So he talks about his calling first before he goes on to this really amazing doxology that's going to happen in verse 14. And that doxology is just Paul taking a moment to praise God with his words. And he talks about his calling, and he, this is me just kind of equating it to like kind of like an ambassador who represents somebody that's not of themselves, but represents something bigger than themselves, someone bigger than them. Paul here states that his calling was to extend God's grace specifically to the Gentiles. You know, at this point in Paul's life, Gentiles were pretty much aware of who Paul was. He had, been, he had done three missionary journeys. He's been traveling through all of Macedonia, most of the Roman Empire, except for Rome itself. So people at this point already knew who he was. He was a very, very well-known man. And specifically the Gentiles, they were aware of Paul, and they were semi-aware of maybe like what he was about. But any time throughout Paul's missionary journeys, any time Paul went from city to city, he took a moment to go to the synagogue, a place of worship, knowing where people would be to worship God. He would take a moment to go there and bring the good news of Jesus Christ. He would start off with telling the Jews, like, hey, guess what? This Messiah that you've been waiting for, he's already come. You actually missed it. And now he's offering you salvation. This Messiah, the Savior that you've been looking for, is already come, and he's extending his grace to you. And much like almost every single time, the Jews would not really take it very well. In fact, they would get very hostile because this Jesus that he would explain and he would reason with them, like, you know, he came from the city of Nazarene. He was born into a manger, a very low birth, very low means, humble means. To them, they had been waiting for this king, for this guy to come in on a, sword, or on a horse with a sword in his hand and to strike down the Romans. And when he tells them about this Jesus, he's like, this isn't the Messiah that we were looking for. This is, this is a disappointment. We don't want this Jesus. Now, Paul is trying to extend something that is bigger than any of their imaginations, a person that loves them even when they're disappointed in how Jesus came. And this gift that he's giving them is a gift from God. It's grace. This creator, the one that created them, is the creator of grace. And what it would ha end up happening is the Jews would reject Jesus and the Messiah or the, the gospel message, but the Gentiles would overhear this message. During this time, there were a lot of um, Hellenistic Jews, I guess you could say. Um, they are Gentiles who wanted to worship God because they knew in and themselves, like, there's got to be one creator. Everything that I've heard about this, this Jewish God, this, this God who brought the Jews out of, or, excuse me, out of Egypt, that's the God I want to worship. So they themselves were also waiting for the Messiah, believe it or not. And when Paul would come and share that message, it would excite them. Like, wait a second. This Messiah person has already come, and I don't have to follow all of these rules, these legalistic, you know, 
priesthood stuff and whatever, have to sacrifice a lamb and a dove or whatever, and have to pay all this money and taxes to the temple and to Rome. I can just simply accept grace? That's awesome. And it's something that they realize, and something that Paul would be te- uh, teaching them, that God desires to save them. God desires to save the Jews and the Gentiles. To the Jews, it would be like, God wants to save them? Now, we have to kind of get out of our own modern way of thinking and kind of think about how things were back then. The Gentiles were not, (laughs) at least to the Jews, they were not um, good people. They were uh, pagans. They did a lot of practices, a lot of witchcraft. Um, They were were into some pretty crazy stuff that when the Jews noticed that they wanted to start coming to worship God, they kind of treated them like second-class citizens. It's something that, you know, funny enough, our, our country is known to do, or had, had done it a while ago. So the Jews treated these Gentiles like second-class citizens and kept them on the outside part of the temple. And now that the Jews, or excuse me, the Gentiles are being approached by Paul and saying, hey, that God that you're worshiping, that supposedly is dwelling in that temple, he's actually out here now. He already came. And in fact, he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to extend his mercy and his grace to you. This message of no longer being separated from their creator, to them, that was big news and something that they strived to to follow. They wanted to hear from this. And in fact, as Pastor Joe mentioned uh, last night, this is a church in Ephesus that was very near and dear to Paul's heart because they got it. The Ephesians understood that there is no other creator, there is no other God that could do what Jesus has done for them. Now, talking about, you know, that whole, like, God wants to save them, isn't it true that we here can be counted as the them category? Why would God choose to save me? Why would God choose to save you? And I, I say that respectfully. Well, as Manny taught us earlier today, Ephesians 2.4 tells us, that it was through God's mercy. It was mercy that moved in God's heart. It was mercy that led him to save us. Nothing, anything that was great of us, nothing that was anything great of you or me, but his mercy. Verse 3, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed this, or excuse me, revealed it to his holy apostle, apostles and prophets. So I have a question for you. Who here, who here likes the MCU movies? The MCU, Marvel Universe, like Iron Man, Infinity War, Endgame. I love those movies. Yes, I love those movies. The best way that I could describe this or explain this that could be understandable for you guys. The best way I can relate it to is, you know how Kevin Feige, you know, almost every other year, every year he comes up on the stage at Comic-Con or Avenger-Con or whatever, and he releases the next lineup in phases, you know, and this, he actually just recently released the next two phases, and it looks awesome. Um, he, you know, he releases these things, and he gives tidbits, he gives little, you know, hints and whatnot of, like, what's going to happen next in the MCU world or the MCU universe, excuse me. Well, similar to that principle, throughout all of history, God has been, you know, little bit by little bit through prophets, through teachers, through apostles, and through Jesus, revealing what his plan is for the the entire universe. And in fact, I feel like this thing is not even on anymore, excuse me. He's been revealing his plan to us bit by bit. And Paul was about, is going to talk about what the next big thing is, the, the next big revelation that God wanted to reveal to mankind. And in fact, it's a revelation that us today are already enjoying, a revelation that Paul and them were already in. And verse 6, and this is God's plan. Both Jews and Gentiles, oh, excuse me, you know what? And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. 
that was the big thing. That's the big reveal. The Old Testament prophets already kind of knew that one day God would work in some way, shape, or form that not just the Jews would be saved and be able to go to heaven, but also the Gentiles too. That, so the, the, the Old Testament prophets kind of knew that, but what they didn't really know, and something that God waited until Paul's lifetime, or really Peter in Paul's lifetime, was that, yes, the Gentiles are going to be saved. Yes, the Jews are going to be offered salvation too. But guess what? They're all going to be part of one body together called the church. I guess you could say this was God's end game. You know, if you were like me when you watched end game for the first time, I didn't know what to expect. I expected greatness, and I was not disappointed. But I didn't expect to see, you know, Captain America wield Thor's hammer, you know, or Tony Stark giving up his life. Spoiler alert, sorry. For God, <laughs> for God, the big reveal, the end game, is that we here today get to be used for God's glory. We get to be used for his power and his might. The prophets only saw bits and pieces of this, but they never got to experience it. And to them, it was exciting. It was like, our, our creator wants to use us fallen people, and not just the chosen people, uh, the people of Israel, but everybody? And that's something that we can enjoy. Now, Paul understood all of this. But unfortunately, the Jews didn't, specifically the Christian Jews of Paul's time. The idea that Gentiles would be welcomed, not just, or not just welcomed, but be used and be part of the family, really rubbed them the wrong way. Because if we remember, they held their, their culture, they held their, their temple in high reverence, that anybody on the outside that didn't you know, match the mold, was not welcome. You could not enter. You only get this far. And the fact that the Gentiles would be invited to do temple work, everything that you do, the worship team, the teachers, the kitchen crew, that's all counted as, quote, unquote, temple work, work for God's glory. It means something to him. What you do for God means something. So my question to you is, what are you doing? What are you not doing? Now, Paul understood that this was a great work. And if we remember, or just to talk about it, uh, in Acts 21, this is the reason why Paul is in prison in the first place, was for sharing this message to both Jews and Gentiles. The, Jew, the Christian Jews and the other Jews hated it, and in fact caused a riot. In Acts 21, we can read about that another time. And it leads to Paul's imprisonment, which actually leads to him writing this letter. So verse 7, By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. And I love that song that we just sang, you know, the, the never-ending, reckless love of God. If I got the lyrics wrong, I apologize. Paul accepted and was in awe of God's mysterious plan. And he understood that all of it came from God's power, from his mighty power and his will. That same power that conquered sin and death, our sin, our death, that same grace that, that Paul talks about is extended to each and every single one of us here in every generation. And we're going to talk about that in verse 21. You are that next generation, it's your turn. It's your turn to step up on the stage of history and to be used by God or be used by the enemy. And I liked how we talked about, or Manny talked about that earlier this morning. You have the decision to whether to be used by God or be used by the enemy. There is no middle ground. There is no other way around it. It's your turn. What are you going to do with that turn? So talking about that power, it's the same power that saves us today. And it's probably the same power that some of us probably need more of. I know I do. Now, among all of this, Paul also accepted one other truth. He understood that he was a servant to this power. 
You was a servant to God's will. If anybody could boast about being used by God, it could have been Paul. Paul was used greatly. Paul is responsible for writing two-thirds of the New Testament alone. But he doesn't take that opportunity to boast. He takes the opportunity to point back to what he represents. Remember, he's just an ambassador. He's just extending grace. He's not the source of grace itself. He was a servant, and he understood and claims that he is first and foremost a prisoner and a servant to Jesus Christ. He accepted that servanthood because he knew that that comes with power, with of humility. It takes God's power and grace to swallow our pride, to grow from trauma, power to learn from our mistakes. So what should our next response be? To serve. Servitude to God's will and his power. A response rooted, rooted in gratitude, which again Paul understood. Earlier he said that he was a prisoner of Jesus and he knew it was all part of his will. It was part of God's plan. God wasn't surprised that Paul got prisoned. Oh no, you're in prison, Paul. Oh no, what are you going to do? God already knew. It was part of the plan. It was part of his design. <clears throat> Continuing in verse 9. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, we read about the fall of man. Now, Genesis, if you don't know, is the first book of the Bible. It lays the foundation of all of our beliefs. It lays the foundation of who God is, what his original plan was for mankind. And it also gives us a history as to why we are the way that we are, why we are so broken and so sinful, and why other people hurt us and why we hurt other people. Well, in, verse, or excuse me, in chapter 3 of Genesis, we see the fall of man. Eve gets enticed by the fruit from the knowledge of good and evil by the serpent. The serpent tricks her. She takes the fruit, takes it to Adam. And Romans tells us that it's Adam who's responsible for sin. Because he knew not to eat of the fruit. And because of that moment, the rest is history. But something that's really cool is in verse 14, when God is cursing the serpent, who really was Satan, he basically tells him, I'm going to send somebody to crush your head and to conquer death. I'm paraphrasing. From the very beginning, your salvation was already being written. If anybody here isn't saved, I hope that that counts you as well. God was going to send somebody for our, on our behalf to conquer sin and death because God knew that we can't do it. For all of humanity's sake, he was going to send his son to die for us. It was all planned from the beginning. In verse 10, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Excuse me. I just want to bring something to you guys' attention. Can you believe that there are angels in heaven and fallen angels watching us right now? For us today in the church, and I, just don't, I don't mean just Grace Calvary, and I don't mean just Riverview Calvary Chapel, but all of the church, every single believer, God has put on display to teach the angels just how awesome and how powerful he is. An object of lesson to beings who are greater and stronger than us. Can you believe that angels still learn? Every single time an angel sees a sinner come to Christ, to them that's a mysterious wonder. Like this is a fallen creature. Angels see God every single day. There are angels who are, were created solely just to worship at the throne. And yet they still don't understand this concept of forgiveness, this concept of salvation that a broken being who is angry, who is sad, who has had trauma and causes trauma can be totally changed around 
and be used to glorify the same God that I glorify? That's a mysterious wonder to them. And that should excite us. Serving Jesus, being a Christian, is exciting. Because God just desires to use you. If he asks anything of you, one thing, he just asks you to trust him. We're going to get to that trust here in a minute. In verse 11, this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. John 19.30, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, Jesus is our sin atonement, meaning he's our blood sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice. That blood washes our sins clean. Just about right before Jesus gives his last breath, specifically in John, in John's remembrance of how things transpired, in verse 30, the last thing that Jesus says before he dies is he says, it is finished. So that curse, remember, that curse that God gave the serpent, I'm going to send somebody to crush the head of sin and conquer death. We fast forward to John chapter 19, verse 30. Jesus says, it is finished. It is done. What has happened has happened. So there's no need to be scared anymore. There's no need to be doubtful anymore of God's will, of his purpose. Because if God can work nearly 4,000 years of history for one specific moment, for one specific sentence, do you not think that that's the same God that desires to use you for a specific moment or a series of specific moments in your life? Our lives are made of moments. Our lives are made of very significant things that happen to us, but a lot of times we focus on those negative things. We focus on those circumstances. Verse 12, because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. The work that Jesus did, that completed work. I want to say one thing. God is not angry with you. God is not disappointed with you. Does it break his heart whenever a Christian sins? Yes. Every single time an unbeliever says no, yeah, that hurts. And I'm not trying to paint Jesus or God as a, a very weak person. It's just the opposite. It's because he has so much to offer you that the moment that you choose something else to him is like, why would you choose anything else but me? Am I not enough? Is he not enough for you? If there's anybody here who's not saved, what more could God do? And if there is a believer here who's just holding on to sin or holding on to an event or something that's happening to them, is not what Jesus did for us way more important than anything else that has happened? It's because of that work that Jesus did for us is that we can come boldly to God and say, God, I'm struggling. I'm struggling here, God. I'm, I'm depressed. I'm angry. I'm hurt. This person hurt me. I feel guilty about hurting this person, and it's just a snowball effect, and Jesus is right there. He's like, whoa, 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 slow down. Breathe. Take a moment. Remember what I did for you. It's covered with my blood. It's covered with his blood. Now, the Old Testament prophets only saw glimpses of this. We're only told glimpses of this. Kind of like Easter eggs, you know? Every single time we watch, you know, an MCU movie or whatever, we stay after the credits to get that, you know, little teaser thing or whatever. That's exactly what happened with the Old Testament prophets. It was like, God is just giving me just enough to keep me excited and to extend that excitement to the next generation. Verse 13, which is why here in verse 13 he says, So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. I am suffering for you, so you should feel honored. He reminds them to always remain encouraged despite circumstances. Your growth in your faith in Jesus can and will be stunted if you let distractions and if you let negative circumstances or positive circumstances become your priority. A priority, excuse me, a priority over your walk with Jesus Christ. And we don't want that for you guys. 
when you approach Jesus, don't let it, the first thing happen in your heart is just like, oh, God, you know, I'm so distracted, or, you know, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. The first thing that we should do anytime that we go to God is to first say, thank you. Thank you, God. And I know it's hard. Believe me, I know it's hard. I'll give you an example. When my wife and I had our first son, I was incredibly grateful. But in the circumstances that happened, one could probably not blame me for not wanting to be grateful. Because he was born three days later, stomach ripped open, and he went into a coma, septic shock. He was already born six weeks early, and the nurses and the surgeon said, let's hope for the best. That's all they told me. Let's hope for the best. I can't begin to tell you the, the, that sense of like hopelessness that that came with. But in that moment, even as I was scared, even when I just had no idea, when my wife was in the, the room upstairs, because she couldn't stay in there because she had just given birth, it was just me alone in that room with 20 nurses and doctors running around. I had no idea what to do. I'm like, I'm the new dad. How am I supposed to respond? And the entire time I'm thinking, God, what am I supposed to do? I can't do anything. My son, I'm just as helpless as my son. I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. And as clear as day, that's when I heard the Lord say, just trust me. Just trust me. Now, that's just my experience. You guys have your own experiences. And sometimes we tend to hold on to our experiences a little bit too tightly and let that define us, let that define our walk. And it shouldn't because it's God's power that should define us. It's God's goodness that pushes us to press on deeper, even when, despite circumstances in life, pushes us and encourages us to keep going and to say, thank you, Jesus. Despite my circumstances, I will serve you. I will worship you. So Paul picks up finally from his idea from verse 1 here in verse 14. When I think of all of this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Thinking of that great and mysterious plan that he got to be a part of, that he gets to be a part of, humbled him to his knees. Isn't it true that sometimes we want to be used for great things just so we can, in our, in our mind, imagine ourselves on that stage with the number one prize and trophy, like, yeah, I did it. It was all me. Well, if that's your response to God, he can't use you. He will not use a prideful heart. He may use you in a prideful way to humble you and to teach somebody else a lesson, but you really don't want to be the object of that lesson. Trust me, I've been there. If your response to God and his will and everything that I've just shared with you, if your response to this is, eh, eh, I don't know. I guess it's cool. It cheapens what the Father had to sacrifice for you. It cheapens, whether you realize it or not, it actually cheapens Jesus' sacrifice for you, his life. And there's one thing, there are many truths in the Bible. The one truth that I want you guys to at least know is that God hates a prideful heart. Pride is so detestable in his eyes. Because in a way, it's a creature, his created being, saying that I am greater than my creator. And you may not be saying that by word with your mouth or in your head, but your actions, as you know, that old adage is, you know, actions speak louder than words. Your actions will say who you hold most dear to you, what you hold most dear to you. If your response to all of that is, meh, then pray. Because the same power that I was just talking about earlier can change that attitude, can change that heart. So where do you go from here? Own the fact that you're a sinner. Own the fact that you make mistakes. Yeah, I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. Understand, you can do nothing. As Manny was teaching us earlier, you can do nothing to save yourself. You try to go to heaven with all these good deeds and works. Like, these are the things that I did, Lord. Like, great, but did you trust me? Did you follow me? Did you surrender to me? No. Depart from me. I never knew you. That's scary. That's scary, and I don't want any of you guys to have to go through that. Verse 15, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth, I pray that this, excuse me, I pray 
that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow deep down into God's love and keep you strong. Last night when we went to bed, myself and some of the other leaders were sleeping outside on the cots right here. And at some point, like four in the morning, I had randomly woke up, and the first thing that I woke up to, and this was actually a pretty cool thing, the first thing that I woke up to was a sky filled with stars. I mean, filled with stars. That, for me, I'm a huge like, space nerd, so that's like really awesome for me. So I was like, wow, that's so cool. The first thing I wake up to, and in that moment right there, it was just like, my creator is awesome. Your creator is awesome. The same creator that breathes lives into those stars, that speaks, and simply an entire universe exists, It's the same God with that same power that desires to use you to help you. To help you grow, to help you change. To help you mature in your walk. Because when you grow, you are able to, what's the theme? Stand firm. And this is a perfect picture. You won't be able to stand firm in life when life throws circumstances, as I just told you earlier, life keeps throwing circumstances at you guys. You already know that. I'm not going to, as Manny had said, we're not going to minimize your experiences. You've already experienced some things. And guess what? It's not going to stop there. I'm sorry. I, I, really, I really wish I could say life is never, ever going to be difficult for you and it's never going to be hard. I would be so unloving to tell you that. But what I can tell you, is that if you just simply trust the process, trust God when he just wants you to grow and learn, you are able to stand firm in those things. Can you imagine me running out of the hospital out of fear when my son is there needing his dad and his mom to be there for them? By, by the way, my wife was there in spirit. I don't want to. <laughs> Can you imagine me running out of that hospital? It's like, nope, I'm out. Being a dad's too hard. Wow, three days in? Wow. <laughs> That's lame. And I'm not trying to boast in my maturity or anything. All I'm trying to say is that in my personal life, God had gotten me through certain different things to prepare me for the next hard thing. And he's preparing all of us for that next thing in life. Because whether you like it or not, life is going to keep throwing something at you. I can guarantee something's on its way. And I'm not trying to scare you, but because something is already on its way, you need to hold fast to Jesus. You need to grow into your, work, your walk with Jesus Christ. I've been coming to this camp particularly since 2006. I was in this little bungalow thing, whatever. My first kids camp, 2006, summer of 2006. And I had been a camper. I've been a student. I've been a counselor and a counselor. And with the privilege of teacher. And for, what, 14 years, right? Can't do math right now. For a long time, I have seen my friends, colleagues, students that I have invested so much prayer and time in. I have seen them come to this camp and to the other camp, Echo Valley, and come on this stage on a, on a, on a Friday night to to say to everybody, I've given my life to Jesus. I'm going to commit to Jesus. Everybody, keep me accountable. Everybody, let's stay close to Jesus. I can't tell you how many times, I, I literally can't count them, that when life finally threw that one hurdle, gone, uprooted, lost to the wind. It was about... Uh, I think it was summer of 2017 or 2016. I was just serving in the youth camp for the previous church that we had come from. And the, the youth pastor brought all of the kids down into the, you know, this little area right here. But it was, you know, over there. And it was about 80 kids. And he took about maybe 30 kids off to one side. 
and the remaining 50 kids to the other side and said, these 50 kids, and it's not exact numbers, but what it represents is the most likelihood of those Christians that are here today will most likely leave and walk out of the faith. And everybody's eyes and jaws were like, what? You're in real life right now. And I know we're talking about the MCU or whatever, but this is real life. You got to take it seriously. And it breaks my heart to see a lot of those kids. I still see them on Instagram and Facebook and just reveling and, and, and embellishing all of their sin. And it's just like, this is the same person that I literally saw in tears say, I commit my life to Jesus and is now transitioning into a woman. It's like, what? He obviously didn't take it seriously. Again, guys, this is real life. Only you are given the option. Only you have the power to decide what direction are you going to go. There's only two directions. What path are you going to walk? Again, your walk has to be rooted in Jesus. And something that I also want to say is um, you can trust him. I know life is going to be scary. I know sometimes it's just like, God, I, I really don't know how you're going to get me through these things. Then I encourage you tonight, look at those stars. If you do nothing else, look at those stars. And at least understand that that's the same God that created all of that wants to, wants to create something new in you, a mature believer. Verse 18 and 19. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great, to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. So right here, it resides to the believer that believers should understand at least how great God's love has impacted your life. If you cannot recount a moment or a series of moments in your life where you can say, that was God's love that got me through it. If you can't think of a single moment, then I encourage you to really think or really ask yourself, am I saved? Or have I just been completely blind? Because I get it. Life gets busy, and we get so distracted with school, sports, whatever. Ask God. If you're saved, ask him, God, can you please remind me just how good you are? Because as a human being I am, I forgot. And he'll be right there through the power of the Holy Spirit to remind you of all the things that he's done on your behalf. In verse 19, every believer should be able to say that we have experienced the love, whether it's through your testimony or through something that Jesus has done for you. You know, honestly, I can say, you know, sharing what happened with, with my son Micah, or our son Micah, God has gotten me through so much as it was. God had actually had gotten, through, gotten my wife and I through so much more even prior to Micah's little incident. He's alive and well, by the way. Sorry, I meant to clarify that earlier. He's babbling and running and keeping mommy on her toes. You know? <laughs> um, if you can look back and say, you know what, God has gotten me through that, then you can trust in the fact that he's going to keep getting you through those difficult hurdles. And here we come to the last stretch, verse 20. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Simply trusting him, putting your faith in him, is going to take you a lot farther than you could ever imagine. I was 18, no, I was 17 years old. I was a senior in a, a church academy, and I wanted to join the Air Force. I wanted to be a pilot like, you know, Tom Cruise, Top Gun, you know. I wanted to be that. I wanted to be him so bad. He and I are the same height, and I was just like, it's destiny. I'm meant to be the next Tom Cruise. <laughs> but God had different plans. Obviously, Tom Cruise isn't here to welcome me. God had different plans for me, for my wife and I. So going back to what I was talking about, I was 17 years old, wanted to be a pilot, and the idea of Bible college was a fluttering thought because my best friend wanted to go to Bible college. Like, Bible college? So 
I mean, I know there's college, but Bible college, okay, whatever. And I loved you. And at that time, my walk was growing. I was just like, I, mean, I love you, Lord, but I, I really, really want to be a pilot. This is what I want so bad. Please make it happen. And it wasn't until like about a month or two later that I started entertaining the idea. I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll think about Bible college, Jesus. And little bit by little bit, when I kept trying to reach out to the Air Force recruiter, God was working his will. I couldn't get a hold of the guy. We would miss each other by minutes. I would have my college prep class, try to call him, get things prepped. And then the moment that school ended, I had to leave for work. He'd call the school. He's like, hey, is Isaac there? Oh, you just missed him. That happened for like two months straight. It was so infuriating. I was like, are you for real? My destiny is calling me, and it's, it's, it's not happening. And then I finally just gave up. I was like, you know what? Fine, God. What do, you, what do you want me to do? What do you have called for me? Because sometimes it takes that level of frustration. It shouldn't really, but unfortunately because we're fallen, sometimes God will let it get to that point of frustration to finally break you and get you on your back to where the only direction you're looking is looking up and say, all right, God, I, I give. What do I need to do? And within two months, God had already had a job for me, a place to stay, companions to go to Bible college, and it was the best experience of my life, next to being married and, you know, the experience of, with my wife and, you know, our, our kid and whatnot. But for a teenager, that was amazing. I got to live in one of the most beautiful cities in our country. God had taken me through so much. There was a lot of hard times in Bible college, but even then, God got me through that. It was probably the most loneliest time, but also the most close that I've ever felt to Jesus in my life. And coming back to what Paul is saying here is that work within us that will accomplish infinitely more than you can ask. All you have to do is just ask, God, what do you want me to do? It may not be Bible college for you. It may not be a pilot for you, though I will be envious if you become a pilot. If you become a rich doctor or simply flipping patties at McDonald's, that's okay. That's okay because you, you can trust in the fact that whatever God has for you is his best. And the last little picture that I'll give you is, I think it was about a year ago, you know, just scrolling through Instagram, you know, those really cheesy, you know, Jesus memes or whatever, accounts or whatever. Um, well, they actually put up a, a semi-serious one, and it was this picture of uh, a little cartoon of, like, this little girl, you know, cute little girl with her little teddy bear, you know, had a dress, you know, fuzzy, you know, whatever. And she's holding tight to it, and Jesus is right there extending his hand, and he's like, just trust me. And the little girl's like, no, I want to hold my teddy bear. It's my teddy bear. It's mine. No. But what she doesn't see, but what we see, is that on one hand, he's extending his hand, and on the other hand, behind his back, is a huge, bigger, fuzzy teddy bear with the same dress. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is trying to offer you a teddy bear, but in a very cheesy, you know, picture, and something that you could trust that whatever God has for you is far better all you have to do is just hold your idea of how your life is going to go with a loose grip. Extend your hands to Jesus. It's like, God, this is my life. I can trust you. Help me to trust you further. Because we can. And to close it up with verse 21, I'm going to ask something a little weird of you guys. If you guys could please stand as I read this verse, and then we'll close in prayer. And the reason why I ask you guys to stand, because I really do want to give honor to God. Take a moment for all of us to praise him with his word. So Paul finishes one of the most beautiful parts of scripture that just brings so much glory and honor to Jesus. He says, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. You guys are that next generation. You can trust in that power. You just simply have to ask and have faith, even if it's just a little bit. I promise you, as Paul says here, that glory is waiting for you. Let's pray.